20 years ago, Rachel, a 21-year-old, was making the 20-minute journey to her home from her parents' house in the early hours of New Year's Day 2003. She had spent the evening celebrating at a pub with friends and family. She had stopped off at her parents' house in Hall Road, North Hall, to get changed into her trainers before making the 20-minute walk back to her flat in Saxe Court, Orchard Park. Her mother pleaded with her not to go because it was too late. But her beloved kittens, Speedy Tomato and Batman, were home alone after her boyfriend had decided to go to a party. Rachel promised to call when she got home. She never did. Rachel Morin was born on January 17, 1981, in England, and was the youngest of four siblings, having two sisters and one brother. They all lived together in their hometown. From an early age, Rachel developed a keen interest in music and dance, particularly ballet. She excelled academically in school and later attended a local college to study information technology. However, she eventually decided to focus on her passion for dance. In college, Rachel met a young man named Mark, and they soon started dating. They decided to move in together and rented an apartment in a quiet residential area, which was only a kilometer away from Rachel's parents' home, allowing her to visit them frequently. Rachel also found a job at a local bakery, where she enjoyed decorating cakes. This experience sparked her interest in pursuing a culinary education. In December 2002, when Rachel was 21, she and Mark adopted two kittens. They were both very attentive to the pets, ensuring they were never left alone for long periods. As a result, Rachel and Mark always planned their activities to ensure someone was home to care for the animals. This included their New Year's Eve plans, where Mark was to visit his parents and return in the evening, while Rachel planned to go to a bar with her brother to celebrate. On the night of December 31st, Rachel met up with her brother, and they went to a bar, joined by some friends. After midnight, Rachel and her brother left the bar and arrived at their parents' house around 1.20 a.m. Before going to bed, Rachel decided to call Mark to check on him but found he was not home. She reached him on his mobile phone, and he informed her that he was at a party with friends. Disappointed that Mark had left the house and the kittens alone, Rachel decided to go back to their apartment instead of staying at her parents' house. Her mother tried to dissuade her from leaving due to the late hour and concerns for her safety, even though the apartment was only a kilometer away. After a long discussion, Rachel left for home, promising to call her mother upon arrival. However, after waiting for about an hour and a half without receiving a call, Rachel's mother tried to reach her both on her mobile phone and at the apartment but got no response. Rachel Moran's mother grew increasingly worried when she could not reach her daughter, suspecting that Rachel might have gone to the party where her boyfriend was and hence was not answering the calls. After trying to contact her until 4.30 a.m., the mother decided to go to sleep. She woke up around 10 a.m. and found her husband on the phone, hoping he was talking to Rachel. However, it was their eldest daughter on the line who had been unable to reach Rachel all morning and was very worried. Realizing that Rachel had not returned home, the family began to panic. They tried calling her again, and after some time, Mark answered. He was surprised when asked if Rachel was home. He said he had returned around 7 a.m. and found that Rachel wasn't there. Assuming she had stayed at her parents' house, he didn't think much of it and went to sleep. According to Mark, there were no signs that Rachel had been in the apartment. Her belongings were not there. The bed was as he left it and the kittens had not been fed. This escalated the family's panic. 
The family called Rachel's friends and other relatives, but no one had seen her that night. Subsequently, Rachel's parents decided to inform the police. Although Rachel was almost 22 years old and the police might typically wait before starting a search for a missing adult, they decided to begin the search immediately in this case. They inspected her apartment and interviewed all her family members and friends. The police quickly ruled out the possibility that Rachel had left of her own free will, given her background and the accounts of her loved ones. During the investigation, Rachel's mother recalled a moment from the night Rachel disappeared. When Rachel was leaving for her apartment, they had a discussion literally at the doorstep, standing with the door open as her mother tried to convince her to stay. At one point, an unknown man passed by the street. Rachel's mother even considered asking him to accompany her daughter home, but decided against it. After receiving a basic description of the man seen near Rachel Moran's location, the police began searching for him as he was headed in the same direction as Rachel shortly after her departure. This individual might have witnessed something relevant. Police units were alerted while the search for other clues continued. Investigators started scrutinizing Mark, Rachel's boyfriend. First, it was discovered that there had been an argument between them that night when Rachel found out he had gone to a party. Secondly, during his interactions with the police, Mark did not appear distressed despite his girlfriend's disappearance. These factors led the investigators to consider the possibility of his involvement in her disappearance, prompting them to verify his alibi. Mark stated he returned from the party after 6 a.m. The police confirmed his statement by speaking with people present at the party. Rachel's relatives also insisted that Mark would never harm her. Investigators requested Rachel's mobile operator and bank data and found that she had not used her phone or bank card since her disappearance. At that time, mobile phone geolocation tracking and cellular tower data were not sophisticated enough to be useful, especially over short distances. The police decided to obtain all surveillance camera recordings within a 10-kilometer radius of her route. Patrols were dispatched to each store, and residents in these areas were interviewed, hoping someone might have security cameras installed. Soon, they spotted Rachel on one of the cameras, just a few hundred meters from her residential complex, confirming she was heading home and not elsewhere. The search was intensified in this area, involving search dogs, helicopters, and dozens of officers combing streets, fields, and bodies of water. Streams and artificial channels were drained in the search, but these efforts yielded no results. As time passed, the police increasingly suspected that Rachel might no longer be alive, but the search continued on a larger scale. Two weeks later, a concerning clue emerged. One of the channels near Rachel's apartment was drained, and her shoe, which she had worn when leaving her mother's house, was found. The following day, a trash bag was discovered in the same channel containing a woman's purse with cosmetics, a mobile phone, and other items, including Rachel Moran's passport. These findings led Rachel's family and the investigators to believe she was probably deceased, and the police continued scouring the channels. There was a possibility that an unknown perpetrator had disposed of Rachel's body there, but further searches led to no additional discoveries. In the subsequent days, detectives dedicated even more effort to the case, deciding to resort to a popular tactic in England. The police found a woman who resembled Rachel Moran and dressed her in clothes similar to those Rachel wore on the night of her disappearance. They asked her to follow the same route Rachel took, and this reenactment was recorded and broadcast on local television channels. The purpose of this experiment was to find witnesses who might have seen Rachel on the night she disappeared but didn't think much of it or had simply forgotten. The visual recreation of the scene was successful in jogging memories, and several people contacted the police with their observations after the broadcast. While these testimonies were ultimately not very helpful to the case, the detectives did gain some significant leads. 
In addition to witnesses, owners of surveillance cameras in the area also approached the police. Initially, the police had received most of these recordings, but some had been overlooked and proved to be fruitful. The administration of a school located about 150 meters from Rachel's apartment provided footage from the night in question. The quality was poor, but the police saw a woman heading towards the apartment complex and, seconds later, someone following her. They suspected this individual might be the unknown offender who could have attacked Rachel. However, the poor quality of the footage prevented identification of any distinguishing features. The police theorized that if the person responsible for Rachel's disappearance was this individual, they couldn't have transported her body too far without a car. They assumed the perpetrator lived in the area and decided to attempt to search every house within a two-kilometer radius. This required residents' permission and considerable time, so over 100 officers were involved, knocking on doors and requesting to inspect properties. The search began on January 28th, with officers divided into groups, each accompanied by a specialist in property inspection. Hours into the search, one of the teams encountered something alarming at the last unit. The police were allowed inside by a man who answered the door, but initially found nothing suspicious. Before leaving, an officer noticed a small closet used for storing garbage, which was locked. The man couldn't recall where the key was, but eventually found it. When the officers opened the closet, they discovered numerous trash bags, empty boxes, and other objects. As they cleared the clutter, an officer noticed a human foot in one of the bags. Upon further inspection, they realized they had found the body of Rachel Moran. Wrapped in a blanket and tightly squeezed into the closet, which was very low, the officers were astounded at how the criminal managed to fit a human body in there. They immediately arrested the apartment owner, 23-year-old Michael Little, and his friend who was present during the visit. Little reacted calmly to his arrest, while his friend was shocked and confused about why they were being detained. After the arrest, the officers called the chief detective and waited for his arrival. They took Little's friend to the station while Little remained in the apartment with an officer, waiting for the next team. The officer decided to engage Little in conversation, and to his surprise, Little almost immediately began confessing in detail. Little expressed relief at being found, saying he had long wanted to tell someone. He narrated the sequence of events leading to the girl's death, but the officer found his version dubious. According to Little, on New Year's Eve, he saw Rachel on the street, approached her, and talked to her, offering to go to his apartment. Rachel agreed, and they went to his place where they drank a bit. Then they argued over something unspecified. Little claimed he went to another room and, upon returning to the kitchen, found Rachel with her back to him, holding a knife. When she turned towards him and cut his hand, he panicked, grabbed a kitchen knife, and struck her, causing her death. The officer doubted the truthfulness of this story, as it seemed quite illogical. Nevertheless, he recorded Little's confession, and Little was soon taken to the station. During the interrogation, Little maintained his claim of self-defense. When asked why he didn't call the police, Little said he was scared and thought no one would believe him, so he decided to hide the body in his closet. Further investigation into Little's background revealed a significant criminal history. From a young age, he was caught stealing and committing other minor offenses. He was expelled from school several times, failing to obtain even a basic education. Little barely worked, stayed at home, and consumed alcohol and drugs. His acquaintances mentioned that Little often fantasized about meeting different women. He once even claimed he was dating a very tall and beautiful blonde girl. Although Little's friends knew he was not actually in any relationship, this detail caught the detective's attention. Rachel matched the description of the type of woman Little often fantasized about, approximately the same height and blonde hair. 
The detectives hypothesized that Little might have chosen Rachel as his victim based on these characteristics. They also established that Rachel did not know Little, despite living on nearby streets. The investigators reconstructed the timeline of that night and found that Little had been with his friends on the evening of December 31st, preparing to celebrate the new year. However, Little left their company in a rage because the girl he was trying to flirt with had left with his friend. He then headed to another party and left shortly after midnight, following a route that intersected with Rachel's path. Upon reviewing all available facts, the detectives came to an alarming conclusion. They recalled the stranger who passed by Rachel and her mother while the latter was pleading with her daughter not to walk home alone. The police suspected that this man was Little, a theory indirectly confirmed by surveillance camera footage. The recording showed a man resembling Little passing by shortly before Rachel, and in a subsequent recording, an unknown man was seen walking behind her. If this man was Little, he must have stopped somewhere to wait for Rachel to pass and then began following her. This scenario contradicted Little's own story. Further contradictions emerged after medical experts presented their report. Rachel's body had 27 stab wounds inflicted with great force, and she had no defensive wounds, contrary to Little's claim of a fight between them. Additionally, some of the wounds were inflicted from behind and no cuts were found on Little's hands. These facts unequivocally indicated that his story did not match reality. Based on all the available data, the detectives formulated a more plausible version of events. On that night, Little, feeling spurned from being rejected at the first party, passed by Rachel's mother's house. Hearing part of their conversation, he understood that Rachel would be walking home alone. She fit the type of woman he fantasized about, so he decided to attack her or try to talk to her. He advanced a bit, stepped off the main street and waited for Rachel to pass, then began following her. The situation could have developed in two scenarios. Either he attacked her immediately or attempted to flirt with her. In the scenario where Rachel might have ignored Little and walked away, there were several reasons for this. Firstly, she had a boyfriend. Secondly, she would not go to the home of a stranger who approached her on the street in the middle of the night. And thirdly, Rachel was very concerned about her kittens. And thirdly, Rachel was very concerned about her kittens. Upon learning that her boyfriend had left them alone all night, she was focused on getting home as quickly as possible. The most likely scenario was that Little attacked Rachel when she was close to her home and dragged her to his apartment. Criminologists found evidence supporting this theory. There were mud stains on the back of Rachel's legs, indicating she had been dragged along the ground. They also determined that the murder did not occur in the kitchen, but in the hallway, where most of the blood stains were found and which the criminal tried to clean. Despite all this, Forensic experts determined that Rachel had been sexually assaulted and Little's DNA was found on her body. This indicated that Rachel could have been dead by the time these events occurred. Based on all this evidence, murder charges were filed against Little on January 31st. However, he had hired a lawyer by then and retracted his initial statements, claiming he had not killed anyone. Eventually, the case went to trial in October, where Little's lawyers presented a new version of events. Little now claimed that his friend was the actual murderer. This was the same friend who was arrested with him on the day Rachel's body was discovered but was later released due to a lack of evidence linking him to the case. According to Little, he returned home early in the morning and found his friend and Rachel there. He claimed his friend had met Rachel and decided to go to his apartment because he had the keys. The three of them drank together, and then Rachel and Little went to the bedroom and had sexual relations. Shortly after, his friend burst into the room, angry, feeling sympathy for the girl, and enraged upon discovering their relationship. He grabbed a knife and stabbed Rachel multiple times, then threatened Little. Little demanded that his friend help him clean up the blood and never speak of what happened. 
Otherwise, he threatened to kill not only Little, but also his loved ones. As one might expect, no one believed this story. It contradicted the evidence and common sense. All indications pointed to Little as the real murderer, with no evidence implicating his friend. The trial concluded fairly quickly since the defense could not present any evidence to refute their client's guilt. As a result, Little was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 25 years. If his parole application is approved, he could be released at the age of 58. Rachel's murder was a devastating blow to all her family members, but her older sister, who suffered from diabetes, was particularly affected. The stress of the situation severely impacted her health. After a long struggle, she passed away in 2010, and her family blames Little for her death as well. Thus, the actions of this criminal led to two tragic losses. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.